said no, but I really would love to leave a record for my children so they'll understand why daddy was so much out of their lives and why daddy got involved in the whole struggle for um, United Ireland. And I says, well, you should do, you should start that and do that. And he says, sure, I can barely write my own name sort of thing. And I says, would you help me with it? And I says, well, you're in Port Leash and I'm in Porty Down. You know, that sort of went, Paul's no life story would make a damn good novel. And I says, when you're telling the truth, my granny always would have said, no matter what, truth will out. And I says, I think that would be a good title for your book because there's no holes barred. It is the absolute truth. The thing that Paul wanted me to say there was the, the centre here is an Irish Republican ex-prisoner centre here for ex-combatants. And it's a, it's a safe sanctuary for prisoners who are feeling under pressure, who, who want that sense of uh, comradeship, sense of friendship. Paul is one of our members and we were very honoured that he asked us to host this book launch and uh, he just wanted me to, to express the fact is that this centre is here for all ex-prisoners, for all ex-combatants. Perspective, you know, through my eyes, it wasn't open any agenda or anything else, it was purely an honest account as I seen it and I felt and me growing up and uh, when Philip Mina gave me the published uh, copy of it, and, uh, I have to say, and put my hands up to say, I'm proud of the fact now that, that it is published. I'm proud of the fact that I'm one of the individuals that took part in the protest and defeated the Brits with just their body. Fair enough, we, uh, we paid a, a very costly price for it. Go ahead. I was interested in what you were saying. Paul, about the chemicals that were thrown, you pulled that down, the, the, the cancer, the, uh -huh. the, the year of cancer now. And you, would you like to elaborate I on that? I will. And the number, there's over a third of uh, uh, the blanket men that was in the wing that I was on are now dead or have been, no, uh, and others are getting diagnosed. Like I, I just hear just say, if an other fellow that was in the wing that has been diagnosed with cancer, and a uh, you have to ask the question, you know, it has it anything to do with those chemicals? You know, we don't know what was in those chemicals. There were, there were three under a cell at, uh, at night, and uh, the fumes that they give off, we immediately had to break the, the Wondies, you know, just to get breathing, and the water was running out of our eyes and everything else. But now, when you hear of all the, uh, the men that I was on the blanket with, all dying, and, you know, in their 50s, you know, from cancer, and our men have been diagnosed, we have to ask the question, you know, had it anything to do with those chemicals? Who ordered, you know, give the order that those chemicals, you know, be thrown in the cells? Because it just uh, it wasn't the present governor decided to do it. I no, no, I understand what you mean. That's I, why I'm asking. Is it, there's some more male women here as well. Uh, you know, it, 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 it had to come from a, a higher level. And there's so, a lot of, you see from the 30 year resident women that were in her lap. Uh-huh. It's me and Pauline, I think. There's 12 girls dead from cancer now already. Uh -huh. and the rest of them have respiratory problems and uh, cancer-related illnesses. Uh -huh. Now we're pursuing that obviously, but I was interested in what you had to say as well, because there was a best in on that as well. And when we were hosed down, the cells were hosed down, so the women were obviously badly affected. Yes, I see. Oh, you know, I will be so yeah, yeah, yeah. This young man, many of you have been through it, is now in a cell as a hot summer's night. Um, no mental, physical, social stimulation, nothing pig and cell and the whole lot and obviously his mind starts to, to travel back to home. So it's late one evening I was awakened from sleep by a strange noise. At first I froze, fearing what it could be. I stared out at the stars and I started thinking about my family life back home. It was a Sunday night and I knew all the young people in Balahi would be heading home from the dance in the local parochial hall. How I envied them. I start asking myself, what would they like to go to the dance? To have a beer? Or oh, to have Ma's Sunday dinner? To share and put on clean clothes? To talk to a girl? To kiss a girl? I could feel myself starting mentally to fall into a deep black hole of depression. Every fibre of my body felt like it was being sucked into nothingness and I willingly was allowing myself to let it go, to let it happen. I heard the strange noise again, like scratching. This annoyed me at first because that black hole seemed safe and comforting, but I was forced to concentrate instead on the noise. I was used to the loud rumbling of the rats, 
but this noise was softer, more gentle. Then I noticed it. The moon had changed direction and a soft silvery light threw a soft warm glow into my cell. A tiny field mouse was busy feeding its face on the rubbish. I watched in amazement, its small flash coloured paws rummaging away, then sitting back to enjoy its fine. God had thrown me a lifeline from that dark mysterious hole that I was ready to crawl into and never come out. Quietly and gently, I lifted my kiss pot which was at the side of my bed, and I placed it over my new friend, and a most welcome friend he was to be. I quickly set about ripping a line of wool from my thin blanket, and when I had it long enough, I lifted up my piss pot, caught my new friend by the hind leg, and I tied my line of wool to him, and then to the handle of the piss pot. He ran round and round the piss pot until he could run no more. Then I would turn him around, and he would run the opposite way. I was fascinated. I played with him for hours, and as dawn was breaking, I placed him under the piss pot. The screw delivered breakfast, noticed nothing unusual, and I saved a slice of bread for my little friend. I could not wait for lockup. I had company and entertainment. After four or five days, as I lay watching him run round and round, I lifted him up in my hands and I said, Here, I am a prisoner, and I have imprisoned you. Shame on me. So I took the long piece of wool off his leg, and I set him down on the floor expecting him to run away. But he didn't. He ran up and down the length of my bed, over my chest, and he even sat on my head. I took the slice of hardened bread and broke it into crumbs and opened the palm of my hand. He ran onto my hand and sat contently, enjoying his supper. I had a pet mouse. He trusted me. But how was I to keep him safe during the day? Ah, my hidey hole, where I kept my personal belongings. I could hide him in there, and that is where he stayed during the daytime. I couldn't wait for lockup. My new friend and I enjoyed each other's company. I had saved the empty turtle holders and making different shapes. He would run through these like a maze. I'd make little balls of bread and allow them to harden. I would flick them at the end of the wall and he would run after them and then run back to me. Nights had never been so much fun. I loved that wee mouse. It's hard to explain, but when you're in a situation that we prisoners were in, deprived of everything, even the smallest diversion was welcomed to break in the monotony. Soon all the lads in my wing got to know that Paul McClinchy had a pet mouse and everybody was talking about it. They slagged me something awful about having the first H-block pet. Alas, the screws also got to hear about my little friend and where I kept him during the day. Lunch was over about a half an hour when the lock on my cell door was suddenly shut back. I thought I was in for another beating and I cowered in the corner, hands over my face to protect myself a little. A large heavy bill screw entered my cell smirking. He said not a word, but he took his button and he shoved it into my hidey hole. My little friend escaped and ran towards me. That bastard, that fucking big bastard, lifted his size 13 boot, authoritative boot, and brought it down firmly on the top of my little friend. Not content with that, he twisted his foot back and forth the way you would when extinguishing a cigarette butt. But I was stunned, shot beyond belief. My heart seemed to have stopped. My autumn's apple was choking me. My brain screamed, don't let the smirking bastard see you cry. Don't give him the satisfaction. Vomit gathered in my mouth, but I quickly swallowed. Still smirking and giving me full eye contact, he lifted his death boot and he wiped it on my mattress. With a strong voice, I managed to say, I could do with that boot about midnight when the rats are here. The door slammed shut and I was alone. The avalanche of tears fell, a grown man crying over a mouse. I cried for days. His action showed me how sadistic that screw was and how personal his hate and contempt for me was. But sure, he only made me more determined to fight back. Thank you. Last uh, word about the book. Because I wrote it so long ago, I de uh, dedicated the, the book to my own wife, Wayne, and to the, uh, my brother Dominic and his wife, Mary, and my father, and all the, the Republicans, you know, that has died, whose names aren't in any road of honour. And, uh, you know, if I was doing it now again, I, I would uh, have it dedicated, you know, to all that, you know, the ex-blanket men and prisoners that has died, you know, that has, has died since, and that's why you know that's not in it, because 
well, when I wrote it, you know, it was uh, 23 odd uh, years ago. And the reason why uh, I, I mention you know, for those that aren't in any role of honour, because every parish you can tell, the graves is full of Republicans that, that haven't been recognised. And I hope that with this here, they're getting the recognition that they, they deserve. 